And now, a book at bedtime. Tonight, we bring you part two of our six-part series, Gorbo, Knight of the Kingdom of Mercia, narrated by Bilford Crumsby of the Canadian Shakespeare Company. Long ago, when people were somehow stupider than they are today, there was a kingdom called Mercia. It was dull and simple, altogether a six out of ten. Then the Vikings invaded. Horrible Danish savages, they ransacked and pillaged, plundered and terrorized. Liberals wanted to let the immigrant hordes in by the thousands, but the brave King Durthert boldly called forth his army to stand against the Danish Vikings. But by then it was too late. Farms were destroyed. Villages burned to the ground. Whole sectors of the economy lost to cheap immigrant labor. Just when all seemed lost, the king turned to his last fool's hope, religion. To please the Lord God and receive his guidance, King Durthert sent his only son, the Prince Eckbert, on a heroic quest to climb the Mountain of Ash and slay the dragon of Milton Keynes. However, God was a lot more pleased with the idea of Prince Eckbert burning to a crisp and tumbling down the mountain. But pleased he was. And so God gave King Durthert a vision. King Arthur's fabled lost artifacts. Such relics would surely be more than enough to beat back the Vikings. However, the wise king was left with a problem. His only son, the most valiant knight in the realm, was now a whinging crippled brisket. So Durthert called upon the most expendable peasant he could find within arm's reach, and thrust upon him the grand quest of finding the lost relics. Chapter 2 As Gorbo was setting off, his narrator and producer were about to be arrested for embezzling from the BBC Pension Fund, so we'll have to skip ahead to the end. Ahem. At last, Gorbo arrived at the tomb of King Arthur. There he found Sir Gawain, kept alive for 200 years by... magic. Look, we have to power through this, because the cops could burst in at any second. So we're going to go with magic. He led Gorbo into the crypt of King Arthur, and there pulled back the lid to claim his prize. Sir Gawain? Yes? Is there a reason King Arthur is... wearing a dress? He always wore a dress. Why did he wear a dress? He had the legs for it. You're not in a dress? I'd like to see you keep satin and mink from falling apart for two hundred years. They never mentioned this in the stories. Are you sure? Yep. How could they not? Arthur had the finest body in the land. No one could wear a halter like he could. They wrote that he was the slayer of dragons. Oh, that man could slay. He could slay in heels and flats. Okay. What's wrong with a bunch of grown men wearing dresses and heels and slaying all day and all night? It sounds kind of gay. It was gay! Dear Lord above, we were all gay. We took a vow never to lie with a woman. It didn't say anything about men. Right. We were who we were, unashamed. Oh, but you don't want to hear about an old man in his gay heydays. Look here, the prize you seek. Behold, the fabled plot armor of Lathland. Wow. They say it's so strong it can withstand dragon fire and a falling boulder at the same time. But not bad writing. But not bad writing. Wear this with honor in the name of Queen Arthur. Queen? Yes, Queen. Yes. I'm gonna... I'm gonna go... Farewell, brave hero! 
And so Gorbo returned to Mercia and used the fabled plot armor to... Get your hands off me! You have nothing on me! Pigs! 